Thank you so much, and, and like everyone, I'm very honored to be here, and especially following that amazing video. Um, Mark asked me to talk about uh, using data and design to, on the patient safety question, and as you might know if you know me, this has been a true passion for me, is unleashing the voice of patients and carers in getting to the triple aim. It's, in my experience, been the surest and easiest path to improving safety is getting patients engaged. This year at IHI, we launched a new leadership alliance. It's the most pioneering executives coming together. And they're using this set of radical redesign principles. They're trying to figure out which are the rules that we need to break or change in order to improve safety and to get to the triple aim. And I wanted to give you an example of one. It's, I'm, I'm gonna give you three very quick stories this afternoon. The first one is a story um, of a patient who did change the balance of power. I was in an academic medical center in Rehob in um, Jönköping, Sweden, and I was walking through the hospital and it was all feeling very familiar until I got to a certain place. And all of a sudden I was disoriented and I said, what is this place? And they said, this is the patient self-dialysis wing. So I said, how did you decide to build a wing in an academic medical center where the patients let themselves into the wing with an electronic card key, take care of themselves, clean up, and then go home? And they said, well, we've been working with IHI for many years, we're very innovative. And I said, no, no CEO of an academic medical center builds a wing for patients to take care of themselves. That doesn't happen. <laughs> so I kept asking, and I found this person who I think is responsible for the wing. His name is Christian Farman. He was a, a mechanic at Saab Avionics, so he made airplanes in Sweden. Uh, when he was in his 20s, he came down with glomerulonephritis and ended up on dialysis. He was a mechanic, so after a few weeks, he said to his nurse, you know, I think I can do that. And, and she taught him how to do his own procedure, and then they taught the 73-year-old lady in the next bed, and then pretty soon, in the academic medical center, uh, pretty soon about 70% of the patients in that unit were taking care of themselves. Um, so I, I kept digging to find out what was going on. Christian, now I know patients do their own hemodialysis at home or peritoneal dialysis, but the difference here is that Christian identified that it wasn't just a procedure that you could do at home. He feared social isolation. He feared, he taught, he taught me about post-dialysis syndrome. He taught me how horrendous it is to be on dialysis all by yourself when you're at home. He said, we not only need the procedure, we need the, the companionship of other people who are going through the same thing. And so, uh, after a while, they began to spread this, and then the head nurse went to the CEO and said, we now have 70% of our patients that are doing it by themselves. If we keep them in this unit, I can't achieve any financial savings because I still have to staff the unit for the other 30. So together they came up with an idea that they would build this unit, and that any patient that was capable and wanted to do their own procedure would go here, and any patient who needed total care would go here. That allowed them to produce dramatic improvements, not only in clinical outcomes, and in joy, but also in fi the finances. I asked Christian, I said, you know me, I said to him, what, what matters to you? And he said, I wanna work. And so I, I talked to the head nurse and I said to her, Annette, what, what do you think your job is if you sit in this unit every day, but you don't take care of patients? And she said, well, I looked out and I said, they're all so healthy now, but they're not working. So Annette, the head nurse, uh, every, when a patient is admitted to the unit, she sits down with them and fills out their CV. And once a month, she brings in the employment bureau and she matches them up with jobs. Because what they all said is, now that they're in control of their own dialysis and they're feeling better, they rarely suffer complications, they want to go back to work. So she sees her job as getting them back to work. Your homework. Next time you're in a hospital, see if you can sneak into a dialysis unit. I don't think the head nurse will know how many people are working, and I don't think that he or she will see it as their job. So I asked um, Christian, I said to him, the next year when I was back visiting with him, 
I said to him, what matters to you? I said, do you still, did you go back to Saab? And he said, no, I didn't, and I was thinking a failure. He said, no, I'm an RN. He said, I went to, I was in the hospital all the time, so he went to nursing school, and two years later, he was the head nurse on the ENT unit in the academic medical center. He also had a different influence on Annette. When she was building this different wing, she heard a knock on her door one day, and she said, um, it, it was Christian, and he said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm designing this new wing. And she, he said, well, how are you designing it? And she said, I'm trying to make it home-like, warm lighting, you know, I'm going to have really comfortable lounge chairs. And uh, he said, it's a hospital, goddammit. Why are you trying to make it look like home? And so she said, well, what do you want? And he said, I want this. Spend all the money on exercise equipment. If we're going to go to work, we need to be healthy. That you will not see this in your dialysis centers. I've been to dialysis centers from Vancouver to New Zealand, and it's mostly patients with sheets. And in the most innovative ones, they'll give you an iPad so you can sit and watch a movie. These people are dialyzing either with exercise or they come in an hour before, but every patient on this unit is working on their own health. They've now calculated that their costs are 50% of what it, the costs are in the other unit. Complications are dramatically reduced. The funny thing was they had one of those red, yellow, green complication charts, you know? And at, as soon as they started this, the red went to yellow, went to green, and all the doctors were walking around really pumped up thinking that they were getting better at improving care and didn't realize that they had nothing to do with their clinical <laughs> outcome. And they started measuring success by how they were working. The following year when I went back, I said to Christian, what matters to you? And he said, I want to get married. And he said, before this started, he said, I never had a dream that I'd be healthy enough to get married. And last year, I said to him, Christian, what matters to you? And he said, I want to have a baby. And this is Wilmer. I just got to hold Wilmer. And I really don't think that he would have the life he has working as a head nurse with a baby in a happy marriage if he didn't take control of his own care. When I had said to him that very first day, but Christian, what about safety? He looked at me, and I was thinking he was going to say, well, I have a cell phone. I can call for help if I need it. He said, well, of course the care is safer in my hands. He said, for one, I always do it the same way. You, every one of you does it differently. And two, this is my bacteria, not yours. He comes in every morning. They make coffee for the head nurse because they're in there at any hour they want and they're producing better outcomes at a lower cost. Now, I've spread this model since I've been teaching around the world. There are clinics in England that have now, hospitals in England that have taken this up, hospitals in New Zealand that are doing this, and I finally have one place in the United States, a, 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 surgeon, a, a renal surgeon who's taken this up. He's bringing this back. Annette and Christian, the head nurse and the patient, have flown to Texas, they are his faculty, and I can tell you we have a long way to go here. The very first day, Christian went up to a patient and he started to turn the dialysis machine around and the nurse came over and said, you can't do that, that patient might touch the machine. And so they ran a plan, do, study, act cycle of Christian saying, well, what if I just turn it slowly and we talk about it? And, <laughs> and now we're starting to see data from this clinic in Texas where the death rate has been cut dramatically, complications are down, and I think this is one example of patients pr producing their own care, and it's much safer. The second very quick story, I was in Singapore a few weeks ago. I walked onto a dementia unit, very, very ill dementia patients, 30 of them uh, not able to leave the hospital. The first thing that they did was they brought me over here to this sign, and the thing that they were proudest of was they said 861 days in this unit with no restraints. Not one restraint, 30 very ill patients, uh, 861 restraint-free days. So I said, how did you do this? Now they are using data. So where am I over there? Can you see where I am? What am I in front of? The door to the unit. They, what they said was, when a patient got up and went to run out, rather than just restrain them, they said, well, what was that patient running to? And they found that the most frequent cause of a patient to get up out of bed and run was whenever the doors would open, the patients got this instinct that they should go through the door. 
So they made the doors look like bookcases. They put a book on every patient's bedside table, and not one patient has gotten up to run through the bookcase. Um, what they're using is data. Rather than react by restraint, what they're doing is reacting to the root cause of the, the person getting up out of bed. And I can tell you that this unit looks like no other unit I've looked like, which produces 861 restraint-free days. And then the last story I'll tell you is a story of a patient named Gilbert. Gilbert is a, when, when I go out to speak to uh, healthcare systems or leadership teams, the price of admission is I say, I start the day by interviewing a patient or two on the front of the stage. I met Gilbert, I had never met this man before, and um, we got up on the stage and I said to him, so Gilbert, tell me about you. And he explained that when he was in his late teens, he was, he's a, a, a Hispanic um, man from LA. He and a friend were um, playing with handguns, trying to protect themselves from gangs. And his friend shot him in the spine and the bullet's still there, he's been paralyzed since he was uh, 18 years old. And I asked him about his health care, and he said, it's awesome. He said, the doctors and nurses, they, don't, they, they love me. He said, when, when I come in, it's not like, what's your name, who are you here for? It's like, Gil, how's your mother? And he said, when he gets into his car, and um, he said, immediately his cell phone starts ringing, technology, and all his lab results are already on his cell phone. He can go into his record and see all the notes that people have written about him. Um, and so, and so I was thinking, this is gonna be kind of a boring interview, but I did ask him the question. I said, tell me about your wheelchair, Gil. And he said, well, it's the latest hydraulic technology. It only weighs 22 pounds. I can get it into my car and out pretty easily. I said, does anything ever go wrong? He said, only when I get a flat tire. So I said, well, what happened? I, I've been in healthcare 40 years. I never knew wheelchairs got flat tires, did you? And so he, I said, what, what happens? And he said, do you know when you get a sprained ankle? you compensate on the other side? Well, he said, while the tire's flat, I have to pull the flat tire, and that causes my muscles in my back to go out, and that means I have to take pain medication, and that means I can't work. He had the same want as Christian. So I said, well, how long does it take you to get a, wh what's the process? He said, I call my doctor, I tell him a flat, t he had a flat, he writes a prescription for a replacement tire. They send it to Durable Medical Equipment. Durable Medical Equipment sends out to find a replacement, when it comes in, DME sends it up to the office, the secretary calls me, I make an appointment, I come in to get my tire replaced. I said, how long does that take? What do you think? Three weeks. Three weeks. And a nurse jumps up in the audience and she says, Gil, I got a flat tire on the way home from work last night. I called roadside assistance, one hour later I drove away. She said, I'll get you a flat, uh, a spare tire. And I said, no you won't. I said, how many other patients do you have that are in wheelchairs in your system? They didn't know, Gilbert knew. How many times do tires get flat? I said, the way we do it in healthcare is we do fix and forget. Mm -hmm. Your job is to run out and fix it for Gilbert because he's so sweet. But then the rest of the patients are suffering. We have to move to see, solve, and share. You have to look at not only fixing it for Gilbert, but surfacing that problem to a system level so that every person who suffers from that also can get the same kind of service that Gilbert can get. So we worked on that for 10 months and now everybody can get uh, spare tires replaced in, in an hour. I said anything else, he told me that he's paralyzed so he has to catheterize himself in the men's room in the hospital. And I said, what's that like? I go in, I insert the catheter, uh, and then I go out to the sink and I wash the catheter in the sink. And I said, why do you wash the catheter? And he said, it freaks the guys out when they see me in there washing the catheter. And he said, well, Medicare rules are that I can get 20 catheters a week. And I said, how often do you catheterize? And he said, five times a day. I said, you don't have enough catheters. No, so he has to wash them in the sink. He, said, he, he says, when I walk. He says, when I walk into the pharmacy, there's a shelf called Gilbert Cipro. And he said, two to three times a year, he's hospitalized because of acute urinary tract infections and he can't work. His doctor jumps up, I'll get you some catheters, Gil. I said, no, you won't. We will fix this system. And you know, I said, did you ever talk to your doctor about it before? He said, oh yeah, the doctor told me there is another way. You can microwave it. He said, I started going to the employee cafeteria, but then the guys really freaked out. <laughs> so Gilbert and I worked to try and get the rules changed, but it's just an example of how I think understanding the total journey of the patient gives us a totally different perspective on safety 
tells us extremely different things about what matters to these patients, and simple, inexpensive fixes not only save lives, but save money. Thank you.